Mabari, Mabari, Mabari. My body is my first place of geography. My first map, first landscape. It's the first place I learn the importance of belonging. I do not want to lose it. On my skin, you will see that I'm a child born of immigrants, chocolate brown and tinged with shona, chewa, nebele. My parents held Zimbabwe in their hearts, moved me within it, steeped in its hellos, its food, and its rituals. That land remained alive in our home. On my tongue, the words roll off rough and unruly, a lingering ache remembered, a yearning longing to be spoken. Ndiripo makadiyo, head bent in honor of elders, hands upheld and offering water to wash hands. Rituals my body has performed in reverence remain etched in my muscle memory. I am a river, a border crossed and sunk within resurfacing. How to hold my body upright, shoulders uncurled from lifetimes of insecurity, I learned to stand tall, to keep eyes level, to hold delicately and firmly myself. How to move, ripe, rounded, swaying, gliding through crowds, holding books and pots on my head. This, this is remembered from before. My body is memory. On August 28th, 2014, my life burst open. I was in New York working on my solo performance piece, Looking at Abroad, and as I jumped back and forth across a rope that was the delineations of my body, of borders, of crossing race and gender and sexuality, something happened. My Achilles tendon ruptured. And there I was, 29 years old, with the first injury I'd ever really had in my life. And instead of going back home to put up my show, I went back to New Orleans and began the healing process. Ritual number one, stillness. I was in denial <laughs> when I got hurt. I somehow managed to walk through the entirety of the JFK International Airport with a ruptured Achilles tendon, and not until my doctor said that I would be in a cast for six to eight weeks and a boot for another two to three months did I understand the severity of what had happened. So I went home to my apartment that I just moved into by myself with my dog that I just acquired and cried. I didn't know what to do. See, I'm a theater artist, I'm a mover. I want to explore space and time with my whole body. And I had to sit still. A good friend and neighbor encouraged me to begin meditating. And after a few days of wallowing in my own misery, I woke up one morning, went out into the backyard, sat in the sun, and meditated. And then I cried. And then I wrote. And the next day, I did it again. And then I did it again. I would go outside, I would sit, I would meditate, I would cry, and I would write. And as I did, things began to open up. I began to be more vulnerable with myself, more honest about the fact that I was sad and depressed and lonely and that I had a lot of people around me who were there to support me, and thus began my gratitude practice. Ritual number two, daily practice. So I have really great friends, <laughs> and after this happened, one of my friends uh, organized a schedule, and so there were people who came and walked my dog in the morning, and people who came and walked my dog in the evenings, and friends who brought over lunch because I couldn't stand that long to cook, and friends who brought over dinner. And I would start to write on Facebook everything that I was grateful for. I'm grateful for Emily who walks my dog. I am grateful for Savannah who made me lunch. I am grateful for the coloring books that Chris brought by for me to pass my time. Uh, the fall of 2014 was also about when the Black Lives Matter movement became really visible um, in the media. And as a writer, I started writing poetry. So everyone, every black person, every black boy, every black girl that was murdered by the police, I began to write a poem for them. 
and that became part of my practice. And then I wanted to find ways to invite other people into the rituals that I was creating for myself. And so I had a party. <laughs> I had a casting party with my friends. Um, and everyone came over, and we decorated my cast together. And there um, was this lovely little girl giving side eye. And on the back, it said S is for Soul Sister. And they drew some stars and some suns, and they did my toenails, because, you know, adornment is very important. Um, and we had a really great time. And we also wrote together. And we sang together. And we colored together. And I started to form communities of practice around the rituals that I was creating for myself. I am a uh, multidisciplinary ritual and theater performance artist. So for me, it's really important that my work becomes an extension of myself, goes out beyond myself, and this was a way to begin doing it. My solo show, Looking at Abroad, um, the piece from the beginning is from that piece, is about finding home in one's body, about traversing borders and boundaries. The piece was supposed to happen in October of 2015, and instead, my friends and I in the Wild Seeds Octavia Butler Emergent Strategies Organizing Book Club decided to host an event called the Wild Seeds Weekend of Magic. And during that event, there were three um, occasions. There was a conversation about gender-based violence, there was a pop-up show, and there was a black feminist healing revival. And again, it was a place to take the tools that I had been cultivating, the preparation that I had laid, and to start to do something with it to create some collective ritual around the grief that so many people were holding, the joy that we wanted to manifest. And so at this revival, we meditated, and we cried, and we wrote, we wrote affirmations for each other, we wrote prayers, we wrote um, dreams. It was really incredible. Ritual number three creative transformation. So while I was convalescing, <laughs> I had a lot of time on my hands. And I was working with this really amazing book, Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. And I made it through five chapters, and ideas were just coming. Ideas for creative projects, ideas for poems, ideas for books, ideas for movies. And one of the pieces, um, was a ritual performance piece called Vessels that I'm currently working on that is a seven-woman harmonic meditation on the Middle Passage that's looking to answer the question, what does freedom sound like in a space of confinement? I wrote a grant for it in October, started walking in February, got the grant in April, and was on a plane in July. <laughs> this is me in, um, in Benin learning some dances and some songs and some rituals of women there, learning more things to incorporate into the process of my work. I think it's really important when making work about transformative justice to make sure that I'm okay. And I learned from that preparation and from that stillness that in order for me to be okay, there had to be spaces for me to rest. There had to be spaces for me to cultivate and there had to be spaces for me to transform, to shift my practice, to shift the way in which I was operating in the world. So now, I'm going to invite all of you, encourage all of you, to think about what your own rituals are, and if you don't have any, what they could be. And we're actually gonna do a short ritual together. So I'm gonna ask for everyone to find your feet planted on the ground, your chairs are real comfortable, so if you're leaning back, try and scoot forward a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and to come to stillness. And I want you to breathe. I want you to inhale. And I want you to exhale. Inhale again and exhale. Inhale, fill up your lungs, fill up your back, 
fill up your chest, and exhale. As you continue to do this, I want you to think about what you want to release, what's not serving you, what is inhibiting your growth. And on your next inhale, I want you to take it in. And on your exhale, I want you to breathe it out. And now I want you to think about what you want to receive. What would support your work, your family, your community, this world? And I want you to breathe that in. And let it out. Thank you so much for taking the time to be in ritual space with me. I hope that you can find things that help you to better do your best work on your journey. Thank you.